it is, you'll just tell me to slow down. Maybe, David, you can let me know. Okay, good. Creation Health. How many here have heard about Creation Health ever? One. Good. I know, and I've got a couple people here, so I'm going to be walking around quite a bit, so you're probably going to have to stand there. <laughs> I'm sorry. Creation Health. I want you to know as we get started today, this theme right here, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. This is going to be our theme for the rest of the day. You will be seeing some information that you think you've seen before. Some of it will be health content along the lines you've heard before, but it's not so much the information that we're going after. It's, it's how we see it being applied to our lives and how we're being effective with where we are with what we are doing or not doing. Um, so let's just get into it. The fundamental text of, John t- of creation health is John 10.10. 10. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Is this promise meant for today? Or do you think this promise is reserved for some time in the future? For today. I believe that too. God wants us to have abundant life starting today and continuing on into the day when he returns to take us to the earth made new. Now let me ask you a question. You look at this promise, this abundant life promised by Jesus Christ. Do you see that this is an experience that the typical person that, you're, that you know and live with or work with, are they experiencing this lifestyle? Do you, could you say that they have the abundant life of Jesus? No. Seems like most people are kind of struggling. Their lives are filled with a degree of misery. Do you know that even in the church, both on the health care side and on the church side, because the emotional stresses of life and, and I guess you'd say ministry because you encounter so many um, serious things, do you, do you know that one of the top prescription drugs is always year after year? antidepressants so that tells me that we as workers in the church as leaders in the church would you say there's room to grow in this area the abundant life of Jesus Christ there is and that's what we're going to learn more about today I want to use if you'll indulge me the United States as a case study about the health crisis that's facing this planet It seems like the United States has great influence and sometimes that influence isn't so good when it comes to certain things Uh, So I'm going to go through some slides. Now, this is not a lecture on obesity, but I want you to see the health crisis that's going on in in, in our country that I think might be crossing the ocean to this country. Starting in 1985, our government started taking statistics on the obesity in these different states. Now, the way you read the map is very easy. The lighter the color, the better the obesity statistic. The darker the color, the higher it is. Like these darker blues, 10 to 14% of the population in those areas in 1985 were considered obese. I'm going through this very, very fast. I want you to see a pattern. You could turn me down just a little bit because I really want to. There we go. Thank you. And you can you can help monitor that. I want you to see this pattern. I'm going to go through very, very fast. You tell me if you see these, if you see it getting better or getting worse. Is it getting a little worse or a lot worse? A lot worse. New Colorado, 20 percent of these population of these states considered obese. Now, I don't know what happened between 98 and 99 in our country, but almost half the country got swept into that 20% category. New Colorado, 25%. This is Mississippi, by the way. New Colorado, 30% of the populations in these areas considered obese. Now, although the colors changed, you'll notice that they were purple. But they changed to this burnt red. The, pot, the percentage is still the same. 2008, 2010. They say in our country that obesity is an epidemic that's only getting worse. They don't see anything that's going to reverse this trend or slow it down. It's a very scary thing when obesity gets out of control in a country because all sorts of other diseases follow suit, namely diabetes. When obesity becomes an epidemic, diabetes is pretty close to come next in being an epidemic. Have you heard in your country that diabetes might be an epidemic? Yes. Have you heard that in your country, obesity is leading kind of the European, U- European area? That it's, I don't know if this is true, but I was told, someone told me, I think, that Ireland, which I've not seen it, uh, but leads the European region for obesity. I mean, I've seen a lot of active people walking around, and I've not seen that, but I believe the data your government's collecting. When that happens, it's very scary. We had kids at Florida Hospital, I heard about, coming in, being diagnosed with adult uh, type 2 diabetes at 15, 16 years old. When you're diagnosed at that early age, that means by the time you're 30, 
your risk for, I've been told, neurological diseases and kidney diseases is just astonishingly increased. Uh, some bad things. But this is not a lecture on obesity or diabetes. This is just using this as a case study to find out why this is happening. We need to figure out why these things are happening in order for us to serve the people God has called us to serve, in order for us to bring healing to this situation. Just for comparison, 1990 in our country, not great, but not too bad. By 2010, not very good at all. And our Surgeons General say, this whole map is going to be red before long. Burnt red. Now here's where we need to get into it. Eight of the ten leading causes of death in our country, and I think it's true for yours too, are because of lifestyle habits. I'm going to read through this list, and you don't answer me, but answer yourself. Which of these habits, if any, do you recognize are operating in your life? Because if they are, that means you're on a path that might be leading you in a place you don't want to go. Poor eating habits, number one lifestyle habit. Little or no exercise. Lack of, lack of sufficient rest. This is a big one in the church because you have people who are so dedicated to God and dedicated to the church who are working one or two jobs as a family or more during the week and then they're giving themselves to the church and labor for souls throughout the weekend and nights through the church. People feel like they don't get the rest they need. In fact, I was talking to a pastor who was not only a pastor of an associate pastor of a thousand member church in our area, but he was also... Um, administrator in his conference office and he said his daily responsibilities kept him so busy that he didn't have time to work on his weekend responsibilities until 10 o'clock at night and so he had study from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. working on his messages and bible studies and things like that then he'd be up at six o'clock in the morning to get his kids ready to drop them off at school which is right across from his conference office the man was worn out and as he was explaining this to me, I told him, I shared some research with him. I said, you know, there are some studies that show that if you sleep fewer than six hours a night or more than nine hours a night, you lose nine years of life on average because you're sending your body into this hormonal metabolic disarray. You're just really messing things up. So he was, by getting fewer than six hours of sleep a night, cutting his lifespan short by nine years. And that really sobered him up because, first of all, his kids, he, he got really quiet. We were walking on our campus at the hospital, and um, after a few minutes, he said, you know, he said, I'm not going to miss out on nine years of life with my kids. He said, I'm not going to miss out on nine years of service to Jesus. He said, things change in my life right now. He's not an exception, though. Many of the people in the church, many of the workers in the church, they don't feel like they're getting the rest that they need. And it's really kind of, <laughs> it's kind of ironic because we have the Sabbath right? How can a people that have the Sabbath be so worn out? Sustained exposure to chronic stress. Is this familiar to anyone in the room? Stress once in a while is okay, but sustained exposure to chronic stress, that can really drive you insane and cause a lot of bad things to start happening in your body. Blood pressure goes up, can be associated with cardiovascular disease, those sorts of things. Uh, risky behavior is another lifestyle disease, like smoking and drug use. You could put up there overeating. You could put up there overworking. Minimal to no playtime or time for solitude because you're spending so much time taking care of other people's needs, you have no time for yourself. And so you reach the point where you resent it because you want to live. You just don't want to exist. You know that you have a life and you want to live and enjoy things God has blessed us with here. This is a big one in the church I've noticed as a pattern. Limited family or meaningful relationship time. Because you're, busy, you're so busy doing the Lord's work, who comes second? Or who comes last a lot of the times? Your family does. Now I just want to say, uh, this is particularly, how should I say, important to me. Because I've grown up in the church, my dad's a retired pastor, I never saw my dad growing up. He was always working on a sermon, he was always at a committee, or he was uh, visiting, he was just never there. And, uh, and we played catch a couple of times. I don't know what it was like with you and your parents, but my dad was always doing the Lord's work, and I knew, I knew very firsthand uh, that uh, the Lord's work came first. And, uh, you know, I love my dad, and as he's gotten older and I've gotten older, we've made a point to do things every year, father and son, to kind of catch up on that. Uh, but it's left me with a certain belief. And I believe this, and you're free to believe whatever you want to believe. I know that Jesus Christ is returning to this earth soon. He's going to reunite us with our loved ones. 
And for those of us who have said goodbye to loved ones who've meant so much to us, on resurrection morning, the first person you'll be looking for is not your boss, is not your pastor, your conference president. It's going to be the loved ones you've laid to rest in the grave. Whether it's your mother, whether it's your father, whether it's your child, whether it's your aunt, your uncle, I don't know who. I'm tearing up a little bit because I just, I lost my uncle last weekend. Yes. Amen. I do too. And I, I ache for it because I don't know, you, some of you might know him, some of you might not. Have you heard of Ron Halverson? He's my uncle. His wife is my dad's sister and uh, he died last Friday night. I got a text from my aunt. She said it's critical. Come to the hospital. And I got there just as they were performing CPR on him. And they worked on it for 20 minutes, and the doctor finally came into the room and uh, said he didn't make it. He was 77, and uh, he'd been fighting for his health for about um, six months now, and he's such a fighter. He had, he had the best attitude of anybody I've ever known. And he loved God and he loved people, and you're wondering why, you know, why wasn't he healed? And then, because then, people all around the planet, I forget how many hundreds of thousands of people in the social media were ministering to our family during that time. And I got to thinking, you know, I really want to see him again. And I think of all those years, he would say, well, Lionel, come over to, he lived in Crystal River, which is about two hours from where I live. We both lived in Florida. He said, come on over, we'll go out on the boat, we'll go. He liked to fish. I don't like fishing, but I liked going out on the boat with him. You know, and uh, it seemed like when Jennifer, Jennifer has been traveling like crazy through the years. Before we had our son, she was gone 200 days a year on average with her music ministry. And I'm, I'm gone, have been gone upwards of 100 days a year. And it seemed like whenever we were together and could have some time with Uncle Ronnie, he was gone on meetings. And I got to thinking, you know, we always say, well, we'll, we'll figure it out uh, next month or we'll figure out more time next year. But the, th- but the thing is, y- you can't bank on next month or next year. And God has given you responsibility not only to serve him and honor him, but you are in charge of you and your family. And God does not ask you as a general rule of thumb to sacrifice or throw away your family in doing his work. The time will come where decisions need to be made that are life and death decisions, I believe, but perhaps that time isn't now. And if it's in resurrection morning, I'll be looking for my uncle, I'll be looking for whomever else we'll have laid to rest by that time. If it's important enough on that day to go find those people that you love so much, if it's important enough then, it's, an important, it's important enough now. And you need to be spending time with your families in a way that's fulfilling and matters now. Because all you have is each other. And by the grace of Jesus Christ and his victory over death, we have the blessing of having each other, not just for now, but forever. We're not, we don't say goodbye, it's good night. And we have that hope in here. Amen. Limited family or meaningful relationship time. I am distressed that this is a pattern in the church of God. It's just not a pattern out in the world, it's a pattern in here. And this is something, if you don't have time with your family that's meaningful, you need to change it now. Understand? All right. Lack of spiritual connection. When this goes, you have no resources left to deal with the stresses that life throws at you. You have no resources. You will be bankrupt of hope. There will be nothing there. And what happens is, is your affiliation with the church, your relationship with the church and God, it turns into like a business transaction. If your spiritual walk with God if you lose that spiritual connection. There's a lot more I could say. This is just an introduction, and I'm not going to say any more. I just want you to look at these. Poor eating habits, little or no ex- exercise, lack of sufficient rest, sustained exposure to chronic stress, and these other four. Are any of these lifestyle habits operating in your life? Because if they are, I'm here to tell you, you're going in a direction that you don't want to go in. Because we don't have to have a, we don't have to have the gift of prophecy to know where we will end up in our life because the decisions we are making right now are stacking on themselves to form a direction. You know right now the direction you're going when it comes to your physical health. You know right now the direction you're going with regards to your relationships and also with your spiritual health. And God has given you the gift of choice that you can make some changes if you want to. Some people say you can't, but you can. All right. This is the most important slide I've seen since my work at Florida Hospital. I started working with them in 2005 uh, with Creation Health. And uh, one of our colleagues put this slide together. She and a researcher decided, you know, we're just tired of talking about the leading causes of death and what causes those leading causes of death. We want to get down to the core of what's causing this crisis so we can bring healing to these situations and to these people. In our country, 
the Centers for Disease Control say that these are the 10 leading causes of death in the United States. Now, it changes every year. These 10 leading causes of death, they stay on here every year, but their order changes. Uh, but heart disease is usually number one. Cancer is number two. I know cancer is number one in Ireland, at least I've been told. Um, so it starts at one, two, and goes all the way over to ten. Suicide made the list for the first time about three years ago. In fact, the World Health Organization says 800,000 people a year commit suicide, that every 40 seconds somebody takes their life because they can't take it anymore. These are the contributing factors that are creating these diseases. Tobacco use, obviously, number one, diet and activity, all the way over to illicit drug use. That's usually where the conversation on health stops. And so what we do as churches and schools and health institutions is, is we, have these, we have these seminars that are designed to throw solutions at bad habits. But do you think if all you're doing is teaching someone to stop smoking, and should we be teaching someone to stop smoking? Yes. But do we realize there is a reason why somebody's smoking? If all we're doing is teaching them to stop smoking without reaching down and bringing healing to the pain point that's driving them to smoke, all you're going to have is a very unhappy, miserable non-smoker by the time you're done. That's why this inner square is so important. Our friend, our colleague with this researcher, they, did a, they, did, they analyzed hundreds and hundreds of research studies to see if they could identify patterns of what might be creating this situation. Here's what they found. These are eight common patterns they found driving the whole health crisis. Anger and frustration, low self-esteem or self-worth, economic disparity, hopelessness, lack of education, a sense of a meaningless existence, external and internal stress, I think that's very, very big, the more I see, and a sense of powerlessness and loneliness. What do you think about that? I look at that and a couple things strike me. One, that gives me a sense of courage because we were designed, we were built, we were created, we were commissioned for this sort of thing. We don't have to be a famous physician or renowned scientist to make a difference in people's lives. We, the church of Jesus Christ, through his grace, we can relieve this, this condition in people's lives. We can bring healing to these pain points. And that's what these are. These are pain points. But it's, the second thing that strikes me is these are more than just pain points. You see, John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, He's giving us abundant life, but what we often don't talk about is the rest of the text where it says the thief comes to do what? Yes, to kill, steal, and destroy. And this is how he's doing it, at the very core of people's souls. So not only do you have pain points here, I look at that and I see one thing. I see that that is a picture of suffering. Now, pain is when your expectations don't match your circumstances. So if you expect something and your circumstances don't match up, you have pain. It hurts. Suffering is deeper. Suffering is when your expectations and your circumstances don't match, but you feel trapped in it with no way of getting out of it. Make sense? So if, you, if your expectations are not matching your circumstances and you feel trapped and powerless to do anything about it, your pain is just now shifted from being pain to being suffering. So what we have in this world is you have a force working to, to, to bring all of these sorts of pains into our souls that destroys us at the core, that turns into suffering, and you have people literally going mad to the point of checking out of life altogether. 800,000 suicides a year? In our country, suicide is the third leading cause of death for kids between the ages of 10 and 24 years old. In our country, in grades 9 through 12, in both public and private schools, according to the Centers for Disease Control, they say 15% of those populations, of those students, are actually considering suicide at any given moment. That actually 7% try to take their lives. People are suffering, and they reach a point where they just can't take it anymore. And they check out altogether. Well, it reminds me of the work that Jesus did. He worked day in and day out to relieve human suffering. And really what he did was traditional evangelism in my book. He relieved people's pain, he relieved their suffering so he could earn their trust and, and, and um, you know, introduce them to their loving, caring Heavenly Father. He gave them a pathway out of the pain and suffering that they lived with day in and day out. And really that's a wonderful calling that each of us in this room has. God has called you to be an agent of grace, an agent of healing 
to bring hope and encouragement to someone who you don't know might be at the end of their, who just might not be able to take any more. And some of them might even be in here today. I don't know. This is important in the conversation because most of the times when people come in and talk to us about help, they just talk about the habits and they talk about uh, the diseases. They don't talk about the why. And creation health is all about the why. Why are we doing it? And it also sets, it also uh, determines the attitude we take when we're ministering to people. So we're just not going into communities with a creation health seminar. We're going there to really relieve human suffering and to bring hope and grace to people's lives. I want to give you eight glimpses of a better life. Creation health. It's an acronym that stands for choice, rest, environment, activity, trust in God, interpersonal relationships, outlook, and nutrition. It's interesting that in John 10.10, 10, that word life, for those of you who know Greek, is zoe, which means life as God originally intended. Now, where might you think you'd find life as God originally intended? Creation story. It's not rocket science, right? When you go to the creation story, Florida Hospital team had this God inspired him with that revelation a few years ago. Let's go read the creation story <laughs> and see what God's original plan for living is. And in that creation story, they found these eight principles. Creation health is about health creation. It's about taking charge of your life and creating your best health according to God's original plan. And in the creation story, we see these eight principles. And I'm going to go over them very briefly, briefly with you. If you'd like to also during this morning, I, I also would like to talk about it this afternoon at 2 o'clock. Um, this right here is a self-assessment to see where you are with, with regards to each of these eight principles. Right here, this creation health self-assessment. This will give you a snapshot, not only of where you are, but most importantly, I think, the direction you're heading in your life. Because we are, as Pastor David said, we are you know, mental, physical, and spiritual creatures. You might find that your physical side of things is doing okay, but your spiritual or mental side, maybe not so much. I think you'll find it interesting, and be honest with yourself. Give yourself the gift of being honest, to really knowing where you are. Um, you, you just answer the questions, and then there's a uh, scorecard on page 5. And on page 6, it tells you where you are, if you have some room for improvement or if things are going pretty well. Take the liberty of filling this in. You can start now if you want, this morning. Um, but I, you know, I might ask you some questions this afternoon at 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock, we're going to cover Outlook. Outlook is the most important principle. People say, well, isn't it trust in God? Well, trust in God is very important because we're talking about spiritual welfare, right? But here's what I've seen as I've been working with this. People's perspective, their outlook on God will determine the choices they make regarding him. So this afternoon, please, please be here at 2 o'clock because so much of what we're talking about, especially with these slides we just saw, that one slide, those eight root causes, will become, uh, will um, we'll, we'll really... For anyone who feels trapped, powerless, frustrated, um, you need to be here at 2 o'clock. Or anyone who really wants to take charge of their life, uh, you need to be here at 2 o'clock because we're going to cover all of that in Outlook. All right, let's just get into this. And I want to I wanna save some time here. Okay, we're going to go through this. <laughs> I'm so excited to share all of this with you but it is humanly and physically impossible to share all of this with you, okay? Because usually Creation Health is an eight-week seminar, and we spend an hour on each one of these principles. So here's what's going to happen. In my excitement to share all of this with you, I know I have too much, and I'm going to go probably too fast. So just pay attention to what you feel the Holy Spirit's placing on your heart to pay attention to, or else you're going to get frustrated in these next few minutes, okay? Here we go. Choice, one of God's greatest gifts. They have found in research studies made national headlines when this came out that folks who have a sense of choice and control in their life actually live longer and are healthier. They did this study in, um, in a health institution where people go, um, if they have health issues, uh, we call them you know, assisted living homes in the United States, the elderly who, who need some help, and they found that when they gave choice to the people in, the, in, in, those, in that assisted living home, they actually lived longer. When they took away choice, and that would, that would look like they would just give the person what they wanted to give them for breakfast. They would do things for that person. They wouldn't give them choices. That people, many more people died when choices were taken away. Uh, it, so to the degree that you feel like you're in control of your life will be to the degree that you're healthy and live long. Now, if I were to ask you and have you raise your hands, and I will not do that, first of all, because you won't tell me the truth, and second of all, it would be embarrassing. If I asked you to raise your hands, those of you who felt like you were in control of your life, um, 
probably 20% of the room would raise their hands because most people feel like life is in charge of them. And that's not true. And God doesn't want that for your life, which is why you need to be here at 2 o'clock because we're going to fix that. For anyone who thinks life is in charge of them, you won't leave her today feeling that anymore. The first thing you can do to strengthen your frontal lobe is the command center of your life. It's where choices reside. These are things you can do to strengthen your brain. Um, sunshine, get out in the sunshine. Uh, physical activity, flood your brain with, phys- with, with oxygen. Mental activity can be as simple as brushing your teeth with your non-dominant hand. If you're right-handed, brush your teeth with your left hand. Just get your brain working. We have a lot more we could say, but I don't have time. Rest. Did you know that if you miss two to three hours of sleep between the hours of 10 p.m. and 3 a.m., your immune system drops in functioning by 50%. How many of us miss sleep between the hours of 10 p.m. and 3 a.m.? You know how long that lasts? How long do you think that lasts? You think you catch up the next night by getting more sleep? Doesn't work that way. That lasts for a month. You you miss two hours of sleep between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m., you've just compromised your immune system by 50% for the next 30 days. In our country, about 40% of the population gets fewer than six hours of sleep a night. No wonder we're sick and tired. Environment. Cluttered. Cluttered environments have been associated with, believe it or not, high blood pressure, headaches, irritable bowel syndrome, depression, anxiety. There's something also dangerous. In our country, we spend 90% of our time inside, and uh, the, environmental protec- the Environmental Protection Agency says that 90% of the, that the air inside our buildings in the country over there is two to five times more polluted than it is outside. And that's because with modern... With modern air architecture, there's very little air trans, you know, transfer between the inside and the outside. I don't know what it's like here. So, but here's the good news. NASA, you know, the agency that shoots off rockets in America, they found that you can do something very easy and very simple to start purifying the inside space that you find yourself in, whether it's your home, your, your office. Uh, you can take one six-inch living green plant, one six-inch, very small green living plant, and it will detoxify 100 square feet of living space. I don't know how many meters that would be, um, but 100 square feet of living space. So get a plant. Better yet, if you have people in your church who are kind of, sh- they're, they're shut in, they can't, they can't get to church, a wonderful ministry would be not only to visit them, but take them a plant and put it someplace in their, in their room. Activity. It's estimated that 250,000 people die a year as a lack of being physically active. There's another danger without, with, with not being physically active, and it's this. Did you know that when we reach 65 years of age, that we, if we don't exercise, will start losing 1% of our total brain volume every year after that, starting at 65? And the one way to reverse it and to maintain our brain strength and brain health is by engaging in physical activity, keeping our minds strong. Uh, they recommend four to six days a week, 30 to 60 minutes of, you know, moderate exercise. We could say a lot more about that too. Trust in God. Did you know that studies show that a relationship with God extends our lifespan on average by seven years? This is a fascinating study. There are many reasons why. One is the value we place on the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. There are interpersonal dimensions that are related to it, as well as faith and forgiveness factors. It's a fascinating topic. Uh, we love sharing this with people in our creation health seminars. Interpersonal relationships. Did you know that a sense of loneliness and isolation increases premat- the risk of premature death by 500%? Is loneliness a kind of pain, yes or no? Yes. What do people try to do with their pain? They try to get rid of it. If they can't get rid of it, what do they do with it? They try to numb it so they don't feel it. Do you imagine that people are trying to numb this pain or doing it in healthy ways or unhealthy ways? Unhealthy ways. So they're drinking, they're doing drugs, they're getting into illicit relationships. They are diving uh, headfirst into workaholism. They're overeating. All of those things compi- that combined increase that risk by 500%. Let me ask you a trick question. What do you think is a healthier predictor of, of good aging? Uh, low cholesterol at the age of 50 or a healthy marriage? A happy marriage. It's a happy marriage. You would think it'd be the low cholesterol. If you're eating right and doing everything right, then you should get the advantage. But you know what? Maybe if you're not eating right, 
God has designed this system that there are things that compensate for other things, and so maybe you're not eating the way you feel or your spouse thinks you ought to be eating, but if you have a happy marriage, you're going to age better than someone who has an unhappy marriage. It's just amazing how God designed this system. So I guess if you have high cholesterol in an unhappy marriage at 50 years old, you're in big trouble. I don't know. Outlook. An optimistic point of view, frame of living, has been associated with, with a 50% decrease in uh, risk of death from all causes. So if you choose to be optimistic, and optimistic is more than just choosing positive words and language and thoughts, if you choose to live your life from a positive frame of view, you've just decreased your chances of early death from all causes by 50%. Put it another way is, if you choose to be negative, if you choose to be pessimistic, you've just increased your chances of early death by 50%. We're really going to get into this this afternoon. Nutrition. Ed Stanley says, those who think they have no time for healthy eating will have to, sooner or later, find time for illness. We'll be putting the time in one way or the other, either by staying healthy or trying to get our health back before it's said and done. World Health Organization says we lose nearly 3 million people a year because they don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables could save nearly 3 million lives. 20% of cancer is preventable, preventable by consuming five servings of fruit and vegetables. And we can reduce our, risk, reduce our risk of stroke by 26% if we just ate fruits and vegetables. Loma Linda University says that living this creation health lifestyle, which is really God's original lifestyle for living life to the fullest, they've updated it now. I've not changed my slide. They say it adds an average to, the, to our life 11 years. And not just 11 years, because I've found out that people reach a point where they don't necessarily want many more years of life because of what they're enduring at that age. These are 11 years of quality health, of purpose, and, and happy years. And people want that if they can have it. All right. I would like you at some point, if you have the time, you can find yourself a pen to do this because I want to ask you some questions this afternoon. I just want to see where you are as we get into the study. But this right here is kind of like introducing this right here. These next five minutes we're going to go through with each other to bring this to a close. My, my hope for you today is, you know, you, know, you don't have to do this, but my hope is you will, because my hope for you today is that we just won't be here, a group of Christians, um, gathering on Sabbath for yet another health lecture. really want today to be a time of fellowship and a time where we really encourage one another to make the changes we know we want to make and need to make in our lives so we can really begin living the abundant life of Jesus Christ. So this is just not some assignment. This is just not some other health exercise. This is really about, um, you know, living the abundant life that Jesus Christ has promised to us. And everybody can begin living that here today. So please, give yourself the gift of going through this today so you can uh, end up living the type of life that you want to live. And I just want to ask, as I prepare you to do this self-assessment between now and two, how sad, and I don't want you to answer me out loud because I want you to be honest. People are rarely honest when they answer out loud unless it's a safe question that's being asked. How many want Jesus to come? Yes! I mean, who's going to say no, right? How satisfied are you with your life? How satisfied does God know you are or are not with your life? With regards to your health? With regards to your walk with him? With regards to your relationships, for those of you who are, who are parents, how satisfied are you with the relationship you have with your kids? Or how satisfied are you with the relationship you have with your spouse? Which direction are your choices taking you? If, if you don't make any changes today, because we all say, well, we'll do it tomorrow, or, or on January 1st, we typically make our New Year's resolutions. And when do we actually visit those New Year's resolutions? The following New Year's, and nothing ever happens. Today, be honest with yourself and tell yourself right now, which direction, if something does not change, what, where are you headed and where will you end up? You don't have to have the gift of prophecy to know where you will end up in your health. You don't have to have the gift of prophecy to know where you will end up in your relationships. You know that if you don't have time with your family and your loved ones and you're always putting something else first, whether it's work or church or something, those relationships will fail. You know right now where you will end up if you don't make changes today with regards to that. If you don't make changes in your walk with God or your relationship with Him, 
you know right now where you will end up there. So if nothing changes, which direction are your choices taking you? Because you're going in a direction right now, and it only makes sense that it's going to end at a certain point. And you know where it is right now in your heart if you're honest with yourself. And so you have to ask yourself right now is, okay, is this where I want to be when that day comes? If you're going in a healthy direction and you're satisfied with it, great. If you're not, then this is great too because although we can't change yesterday, God has given us the power to change today. General Colin Powell said we can't change our yesterdays, but all of us can change our tomorrows. That's through the grace and power of Jesus Christ. We can do that because we've been blessed with the power of choice. There are some people in this room who have been told all their lives that you won't amount to anything, that you can't do something. You've tried to do many, many things that haven't worked out from your point of view, and you feel like you're stuck and you're trapped and life is in charge of you. And I'm here to tell you I love you and I want to encourage you, but if that's how you feel, that's not the truth. And I invite you to believe in a, a new story for your life today, to divorce the lie that you are powerless and incapable and can't do something and believe the truth that you are fearfully and wonderfully made and that you do have power and you can make a difference in your life today because Jesus has given you that gift. If you're going in a direction you don't want to go, you can change that direction. Some of you don't believe it, but you can. You believe it up here, but you don't believe it in here for some. We are what we choose. I used to hate that statement until I really, really realized, you know what? Uh, it's true, and I can change, because I used to believe I couldn't. Reflect on what you want to do, what changes you want to make, and then make them. But please, take this to heart. Joe Thomas says, anything less than a conscious commitment to the important is an unconscious commitment to the unimportant. We need to stop living our lives for the unimportant things and put what matters most first. When you veer off course, what are you going to do? Are you going to veer off course? You will veer off, some of us are going to veer off course between here and the parking lot when we're done today. But if you veer off course, what do you do? You get back on course. We don't have to get all emotional and dramatic about it because you know what? This is the way life works. I was told, actually, I was shocked to find out. I've not uh, researched it to see if it's true, but I was told that the astronauts and uh, airplane pilots are off course 90% of the time. And because of, uh, here on Earth, they have the, you know, the, the pressure and the wind currents. I don't know what the deal is with space, but they're off course 90% of the time. And so what they do is, is they zigzag their way to their final destination. And I'm thinking to myself, if my airplane pilot, if Neil Armstrong can zigzag his way to the moon, I can zigzag my way through life just a little bit. So I'm not going to go and get all crazy when I veer off course. Uh, because if there's anything worse than going in the wrong direction, it's really going in the wrong direction enthusiastically, right? So if you ever get off course, just get back on course and be done with it and start going in the direction that God has designed for your life. Because this is his will for you. Third John 2, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. God does not want you to be miserable. I've heard Seventh-day Adventist preachers actually preach within these last five years, it is God's will for you to suffer. And I say, no, it's not. It is not God's will for you to suffer. The only time God's people ever suffered was when they chose to wander from him and said, no, we don't want you in our life. Then they suffered. Now, that doesn't mean God won't make your life uh, void of challenges, right? He's going to bring challenge after challenge into our lives because that's how we grow. Your muscles grow through physical resistance. Your faith grows through challenges and resistance and having to exercise it. But, that doesn't, but that's different than suffering. Understand? God wants you to be happy. God wants you to prosper. He, God wants you to have the abundant life of Jesus Christ in your heart. He doesn't want you to suffer. So wherever you are right now, with whatever area of your life you are talking about with yourself, about how satisfied you are, you're just one choice away from living a better life today. Just one. One choice from having a better relationship with your family. One choice from having a better relationship with your friends. One choice away from having a better relationship with God. One choice away from having a stronger body, a stronger mind. Just one choice. Because when it comes to health, remember this, please. This is one of the most important things is when it comes to health, it's about progress, not perfection. It's about progress, not perfection. So whatever that one choice is for you, decide to make it and start applying it today 
before this day closes, start doing something to make it true in your life. And as you do that, you'll start living your life to the fullest. That is a very, very, very quick overview of creation help. We usually spend eight hours on this stuff, and we just had about 40 minutes. Um, so please come back this afternoon. We're going to go deeply into Outlook. I th hope that will be a blessing, and uh, you'll be equipped to help your friends who are struggling with some of the issues we'll be talking about as well. But it's time to uh, close. Should we just bow our heads er and pray? Father in heaven, thank you so much for thank you so much for redeeming us, for doing whatever you had to do to make sure we could be with you forever, to make sure that we could live again, and not just live for now, but live forever, and to have fellowship with one another through the ceaseless ages of eternity. I pray, Lord, that your original plan for living life to the fullest will become real in our lives, and that through our life we can help others taste and see that you are good and that they will choose life because they're choosing you. Lord, we love you so much. We couldn't ask for a better father. Please uh, continue to bless this day as we live to honor you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.